One of the things that has been really frustrating in recent years when it comes to the development of transit has been the cost. We have seen these costs essentially rising, going over budget and just getting out of control. A new study released by the University of Toronto School of Cities is showing how costs to build major transit projects in Toronto and elsewhere in Canada have soared in recent years. Somehow in peer countries like Italy, Spain, Turkey, South Korea, the cost per kilometer has been going down, while it's been going up sharply in Canada. And not just Canada, but the other what we call Anglosphere countries, like Australia, US, UK, according to the director of the study. In an attempt to close the transit infrastructure gap, cities across Canada are investing tens of billions of dollars into capital expansion through the construction of additional mass transit infrastructure. That's, of course, in addition to the mismanagement of projects that we have seen of late, such as an entire station that had to be redone on the Eglinton Crosstown. However, over the past two decades, the cost of building new transit infrastructure in Toronto and across Canada has increased significantly, at a rate far beyond inflation. And this is the part that we're all having trouble understanding, and where the government just has not been transparent with the public, who they work for, essentially. While building in various stages the bloor danforth line and the Young University Spadina line, down to Finch stations, between the mid-1950s and the mid-1990s, was less than $150 million a kilometer. That cost started creeping up after 2000. The Shepherd Line opened in 2002 and was around $200 million a kilometer. The Line 1 subway extension to Vaughan from Shepherd West opened in 2017, approached nearly $400 million a kilometer. The Line 1 subway extension into Richmond Hill is forecast to be closing in at $800 million a kilometer, set to open in 2029 and 2030. And the updated Ontario line is forecast to be more than a billion dollars a kilometer. This has all been an even bigger increase than real estate in Toronto. The Ontario line is 10 times the cost of the original Young Street subway line. Even controlling for inflation, 10 times as expensive, and that's partly because we're digging now through established neighborhoods. There's lots of mitigation around that, lots of extra cost to protect people, but these are other factors as well. The study's authors said they looked at data from 60 countries and 1,083 LRT subway and rail projects to establish average per kilometer costs for building transit lines. They determined the global average is $242 million per kilometer, which of course were well above here in Toronto. The authors said that Canada had the ninth highest cost in the average, which came out to $396 million per kilometer. New Zealand was the highest at $1.04 billion per kilometer, followed by Qatar and Hong Kong at $949 million per kilometer each. The three countries with the lowest costs were Chile at $89 million per kilometer, followed by Spain at $95 million per kilometer, and South Africa at $105 million per kilometer. When analyzing the cost differences, the authors noted environmental, market, housing, cost of living and labor were often cited as contributing factors. Their benchmarking analysis, however, reveals only a slight correlation between average construction cost and contextual factors, such as GDP, unionization rates, or cost of living. Even among OECD nations, high on the Human Development Index, average per kilometer costs range across the full spectrum of our database, the study said. The problem is not so much with these countries being part of the Commonwealth itself, rather that these nations share a common institutional history, exchange ideas, and learn from one another. As such, our benchmarking investigation concurs with other studies of global transit costs, strongly indicating that national costs are associated most closely with project delivery practices, policies, and governance. In fact, several domestic cases of low-cost transit construction demonstrate that effective project delivery is possible in the Canadian context with a shift away from traditionally Anglophone project delivery practices. The report added that soft costs have become a huge driver in costs in Canada. Soft costs are defined as things like contingencies, money set aside for inflation and unforeseen expenses, acquiring land, planning, project management, design, and engineering. The headline here really is that these transit systems cost more money and to plan than they do to build, the report says. There is a tradition in Canada of over-design, 
So engineers are designing for the worst case scenario. Just a comparable example, here is how we plan for Black Friday. We plan to build parking lots just for that one day a year. And that's what they're doing with transit systems as well. It's said that two other factors are at play too. An eagerness to cater to different groups and not having enough experts on government payrolls. According to the report, we're overly responsive to external stakeholders. So when you have a com community complaint, we tunnel deeper and that adds to the cost. There's sort of a lack of in-house capacity, in-house knowledge, in-house expertise, and that's costing the country and taxpayers a lot as we, re we rely on professional consultants and then we accept their cost escalations without really much critical thinking. When Metrolinx was contacted, the Provincial Transportation Agency overseeing many signature transit expansion projects in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area to ask about the study's findings. While a representative acknowledged receipt of the request, a response was never received. There is no single driver of transit construction costs, nor is there a silver bullet to bring high-cost projects in line with low-cost counterparts, nor is the problem of high costs unique to Metrolinx. The study's authors wrote as they reviewed a variety of data gathered by Metrolinx. High-cost jurisdictions like Toronto experience cost escalation through a series of compounding factors, from planning and construction to institutional and procedural inefficiencies, which is really a fancy way of saying that the government is wasting our money. While they said further research is needed, addressing the retention of government staff with expertise, potentially reassessing the overcautious approach to managing risk, increasing transparency, and reducing political micromanagement were cited as issues in the paper. It continued on to say that the government of Canada needs to start incorporating techniques and approaches seen in other countries overseas. We don't learn enough from the best practice cases around the world. We're too insular. We're too prone to imitating the UK and the US, and they're not doing it very well either. I mean, in short, what this report found and is saying without saying it is that these higher costs that we pay for transit are a result of systematic government corruption. We have seen this here in Toronto, the Mississauga line and the Confederation line in Ottawa that have been plagued with all kinds of problems. Reducing the cost of building LRTs and subways in Toronto is a challenging but crucial goal, especially as transit infrastructure becomes more expensive with each new project. Based on my observations of Toronto's transit projects and comparisons with international best practices, here are 10 things that I think that we can do to help reduce the cost of transit in Toronto. Firstly, there's the streamlining of project governance. Toronto's transit projects often suffer from fragmented decision-making, with overlapping responsibilities between the TTC, Metrolinx, municipal governments, and contractors. This leads to delays, miscommunication, and added costs. Centralizing oversight or establishing a clear governance framework could cut down on inefficiencies. For instance, in Paris, the Société de Grand Paris was created specifically to oversee their ambitious Grand Paris Express subway project. A similar model here might ensure smoother execution. Secondly, we could adopt standardized designs. Custom designs for each station or system element inflates costs. Toronto tends to build highly individualized stations with unique architectural features, which drives up expenses. Standardizing designs for stations, platforms, and system components, while still ensuring accessibility and aesthetic appeal, could lead to significant savings. Look at Copenhagen's Metro or part of London's Elizabeth Line. They leverage modular designs to save time and money. Then thirdly, we could optimize the procurement processes. Toronto's reliance on public-private partnerships, or P3s as they're known, hasn't always delivered the promised savings. Contracts often transfer too much risk to private partners, leading to disputes and cost overruns. Moving toward more collaborative models, such as alliance contracting, where all stakeholders share risks and rewards, might reduce delays and costs. Australia has seen success with this approach on projects like Melbourne's Level Crossing Removal Program. Then fourthly, we can increase pre-construction planning. Better upfront planning can avoid costly mid-project changes. For example, detailed geotechnical studies can help mitigate surprises during tunneling, and thorough utility mapping can reduce expensive relocations. Some cities like Madrid and Singapore invest heavily in pre-construction analysis, leading to fewer delays and more accurate budgeting. 
Fifth, we can prioritize surface level construction where possible. While subways are often necessary in dense areas, surface level LRTs are significantly cheaper and are faster to build. Projects like the Finch West LRT demonstrate how prioritizing at grade construction can cut costs compared to more complex underground projects such as the Crosstown LRT. Expanding dedicated bus lanes as a complementary strategy could also provide high capacity transit at a fraction of the cost. Then sixthly, what we can do is reduce overdesign. Overdesigning infrastructure to accommodate theoretical future needs can lead to unnecessary expenses. While some forward thinking is essential, projects like the Crosstown have faced criticism for incorporating overly complex designs. A balanced approach, building scalable infrastructure that can expand as demand grows, might save millions. Then seventh, we have the leveraging of technology and automation. Innovations like automated tunnel boring machines, or TBMs as they're shortened down to, digital twins for design and maintenance, and advanced project management software could reduce labor costs, improve efficiency, and minimize delays. Toronto could also look at cities like Tokyo, which integrates robotics and prefabrication to accelerate construction timelines. Then eighth, we can secure stable funding. Stop and start funding has been a, a recurring issue in Toronto transit projects often leading to inefficiencies and higher costs due to inflation. Establishing a dedicated transit fund, perhaps tied to road tolls, develop, development charges, or property taxes, could provide a steady cash flow and reduce delays caused by funding uncertainty. The ninth, we can encourage transit-oriented development. Integrating new transit lines with high-density housing and commercial spaces can attract private investment to help fund projects. Hong Kong's MTR Corporation is a prime example of how transit agencies can use real estate revenue to offset construction costs. While Toronto has some TOD, it could be expanded with stronger policies and incentives. Then 10th, we can learn from global successes. Toronto often designs projects in isolation, missing opportunities to adopt best practices from abroad. Cities like Madrid, Istanbul, and Seoul have built subway lines at a fraction of Toronto's costs. Understanding how they manage labor, procurement, and construction logistics could provide valuable insights. If Toronto implemented even a fraction of these strategies, we could likely build transit infrastructure faster and more affordably, allowing us to meet the region's growing transit needs. What do you think? Are there any ideas here that stand out to you? Or have you noticed other inefficiencies in our approach to transit construction? Let me know in the comments. I hope that you liked the video. If so, please give it a like. If you're not subscribed and want to be notified of new videos that are released, please click on the Art Toronto button here. This is the video that I would recommend for you to watch next, and I'm sure that you're going to love it. Here's the playlist for all of the latest in transit news and views that you're going to find very informative and interesting. And finally, here is the latest video. Thanks for watching, and happy transiting.